Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Sandy, and I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is August the 8th, 2003. Um, I want to read uh, a few definitions for you as I start, and um, I always like to try to give you something to think about while you're hearing my story. And and the two words that um, I'd like for you to think about are hope, because we share our experience, strength, and hope. And today, I'm going to tell you in a general way what it used to be like, what happened to me, and what it's like now. There'll probably be a little bit more about what it's like now because um, I will qualify myself, but, you know, alcohol is in the rearview mirror for me now, and, you know, I really enjoy life, and and that's the the other message of hope that I want to give you is that um, if you're new, the other word that I want you to focus on is perseverance, which means don't give up no matter what. No matter what happens, don't stop going to AA. And that's the biggest message that I want want to share with you guys today. So um, I'm going to read. I have to put my glasses on because that's what happens as you get older. So anyway, um, the definition of perseverance is the continued effort to do or achieve something despite difficulties, failures, or oppositions. The action or condition of an instant of persevering or to be steadfast. And uh, the definition of hope is to cherish and desire with anticipation, to want something to happen or to be true, such as hopes for promotion, hopes for something good for someone. Um, I hope she remembers. I hope that your mother is doing well. I hope good things for you. So um, those are the two words I kind of want you to, you know, kind of think about as I share. And um so what was it like? Um, I was born in 1965 uh, with parents who were very young, and uh, I didn't have a whole lot of parenting. They did the best they could with what they had, but um, I kind of just made my own rules as I lived along, my, as I went along. My parents were divorced when I was very young, and uh, so I was a latchkey kid. And um, I just did what I wanted. I really didn't get in a lot of trouble, but I just pretty much did whatever I wanted, whatever I wanted to. And that worked real good for me. And that was that self-reliance. And it started at a very, very, very young age. And um, thank God for it. You know, those things that we think are so bad, they got us here. They kept me alive long enough to get me to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. So there is something to be said about self-reliance, even when you're in your addiction. So, um As I grew older, uh, I went back and forth between my parents, and I ended up with my father when I was about 15, and he was married to someone not very much older than me, and she was not very nice to me. Um, I was more like the redheaded stepchild, basically, and uh, we didn't care much for each other, and that was when I found alcohol. And, I mean, the first time I drank alcohol, I drank it alcoholically. I'm from Fayette County originally, and we used to have these things called pasture parties. And you'd go out into a big pasture, and you'd take a keg of beer, and, you know, back then everybody drove Broncos and Jimmies and all that good stuff, and you'd just get hammered out in the middle of a pasture party, you know, and we had the best time, and we also would take, like, Mr. Misty's from um, Dairy Queen, and we put golden grain in them. I mean, you want to talk about getting (laughs) drunk quick, you know. And um, we had a blast, you know. I mean, I'm not going to sit up here and say that all my drinking years were bad because I had a lot of fun when I was younger drinking, and I didn't have a lot of consequences. But as I got older, you know, the headaches hurt more than they used to and all that good stuff, So, which I'll elaborate. But um, So I started drinking when I was 15, and uh, I immediately knew what I wanted to do with my life, and it was to become a bartender. And that was what I did. So for 25 years, I was a bartender. And I loved the job. I was very good at it. I excelled at it. Um, My last position was right over there at the King and Queen. It was a Weston at the time. It started out as a Doubletree, and then it became a Weston. And I was an assistant food and beverage manager there. So even in my addiction, I was an overachiever. I was successful. Um, I wanted to do well. You know, um, but I mean, I think, my gosh, all the money 
that I pilfered away back in my drinking days. Um, and I also share, you know, I never really thought that I was much of a thief. I, you know, was often offended if someone would say that. But there were many, many times that I didn't pay for alcohol, that my great customers got, you know, maybe they got they paid for one out of five drinks that they had so that I could pad my pocket with good tips. Um, there were many nights when I left with alcohol, and uh, my particular alcohol of choice was um, Grand Meunier, 150-year-old, if I could get it. Um, and, you know, at the hotel, that was about $300 a shot. So, But if it, was, if it was behind the bar, I was partaking, and I found very clever ways to disguise that, and I found very clever ways to manipulate numbers because I was an assistant food and beverage manager, and um, I stole you know, I never went into a register and pulled money out, but there were numerous ways that I uh, was dishonest. And I only found that out from working the steps. You know, I didn't really realize that that was being thievery. I just thought that was being one hell of a bartender, you know, <laughs> which I was, by the way. Um, I was great at my craft, and I enjoyed it. I always loved people. Um, but um, anyway, so uh, through going through drinking, and I don't have to go through all of it because I know if you guys are sitting here in a meeting at 9 o'clock on Friday night, you know about alcoholic drinking. So um, I uh, went in and out and in and out and in and out of unhealthy relationships, and my relationships consisted of going to the bar, picking the person out that I wanted. Uh, we'd move in together, and we'd <laughs> end up hating each other, burning that shit to the ground, and then back to the bar again to the next relationship. And that was how I lived my life, you know. I didn't know how to do it better. I didn't have any examples of healthy relationships ever in my life. Once again, I'm not throwing my parents under the bus. They did the best they could, but I just didn't have a whole lot of healthy examples. And I was lonely. Even back then, you know, my heart longed to have someone. I wanted to be a good person. I wanted to be a, per a good spouse, a good partner, a good everything. I wanted to be close to God. But alcohol just put that barrier in me all the time, you know. So I wasn't capable of being a good person. And um, um, as my drinking got worse, um, the last person that I was with, and I'll just go ahead and shoot right to my bottom because I can tell you 50 stories. I can tell you about the time that I stood over the sink and uh, puked three shots of Jägermeister death up just to get one down because I was shaking so bad. You know, normal people don't do that. Um, I can tell you, you know, about all the silly and ridiculous things I did. I did get one DUI by the grace of God when I was 18 years old on, I think they call it Metropolitan Parkway right now, but it was Stewart Avenue back in the day. And... Uh, <laughs> South side, um, you know, so anyway, um, that was where my job was, and we'll just say that and leave it at that. <laughs> um, anyway, um, you know, and alcohol took me down a really dark, dark, ugly path, and, you know, I don't share a lot about it in mixed groups, and I won't, but it, it just took me to some ugly places doing some ugly things with some ugly people, uh, and um, my last relationship that I was with um, before I had what I call my bottom, um, he was a very good enabler. Uh, I had already uh, had my car repossessed. I got up one night in the middle of the night, and he also woke up, and he was like, oh, my God, your car's not in the parking lot. Well, I knew my car had gotten repossessed. I hadn't made a payment in, like, four months, <laughs> you know. And um, so he was a good enabler, and he drove me around, and he took care of me, and um you know, I um, I was working at Lowe's at the time. I had already left the restaurant business because it, it wasn't me. It was the field I was in. So I knew that if I just got out of the restaurant business and got into the plant business, <laughs> that it would be better. So the first thing that happened was I got my car repossessed. So then I'm riding the bus, and I got my backpack, and I got my, you know, my mints and my candy and my alcohol, you know, and I worked in the garden center, you know, and I mean, I'm drinking alcohol again, like 100-degree weather on a regular, you know. So um, what ended up being my bottom um, was I used to be the fun drunk. I used to be the drunk, you know, that was fun at parties and we had a good time. And then I became like the kind of like inappropriate drunk, you know, like the like, man, Sandy, you were off the chain last night. You might want to chill out. And of course, when they said that, you know, I just kind of went, well, they're not cool anymore. But 
they also did that. And then I became uninvited to the parties anymore, you know. Um, and my life became very small and very lonely. And, uh, you know, so I rode the bus and I drank on the way to bus. I mean, I was on a bus the day that 9-11 happened, and I was so far out of it that I didn't, I couldn't comprehend what actually had happened. You know, like I got to work, I was working at Hastings, it's a little uh, nursery that used to be over in Brookhaven, and I remember going in and everybody was just like, and I couldn't comprehend what had happened, you know, I was just so emotionally dead, because all I wanted to do was drink all the time, and I was very angry, I had, I had crossed over into the anger, lonely, lonely person stage, and my anger uh, was, was always on the significant other. And, um, I physically abused him and I physically abused him numerous times. And, uh, one night, I think it was in April. Yeah. I think it was April the 15th of 2003. I decided that I was going to go out after work and I had already been drinking at work. Um, the running joke that I like to share about when I worked at, at, at Lowe's was, you know, when you go into Lowe's or Home Depot and like you want to go in aisle seven and they've got it blocked off because somebody's on the forklift trying to get something from the top. Be grateful that they do that. Cause I was the person operating the forklift. I've never in my life driven a forklift sober, and I know how to operate every forklift that they make, okay? So that's a scary thought, and I'm sure that I'm not the only alcoholic that works for Home Depot or Lowe's in the state of Georgia, okay? So it's a good thing that they do that, just a little FYI there. And um, we went out after work, and I proceeded to get even more drunk, Um, and when I got home, uh, I picked a fight with said boyfriend, and uh, I physically attacked him for the last time. And um, it's embarrassing to say that, you know, because now the way I feel is like it's just so wrong to lay your hands on anybody for any reason, you know? I mean, it's just bad, you know? And um, I don't do that anymore. And since I've been sober, I haven't laid my hands on one person. I've thought about it a few times, you know? I mean, I get still get angry. And sometimes, not so much now, but at the beginning of my sobriety, I used to still have that feeling. And I would look down and my hands would be clenched. But um, I've learned a lot more effective ways to deal with my anger now. But anyway, so he had me arrested that night. And um, while I was waiting for the police, I went into the closet with my bottle of Gray Meunier because I figured, hey, I'm going to be there for a while because I know that in Georgia when you get called out for domestic dispute that somebody's going to jail and it's usually going to be the chick that's hammered, you know. <laughs> and he also had a bruise on his face and he was sober. I mean, I didn't get home till late and I mean, I woke pretty much woke him up and, you know. Anyway, so I went to jail that night and um, the story that really really let me know that I had hit a bottom that night was uh, when I got to jail, and I'm sure probably most of you have been to jail, so this is not going to be a story that's unfamiliar, but they put you in these little holding cells first, and then they take you and put you in the pod. So I'm in the holding cell, and I'm in there with this one girl, and she's a tiny little girl, couldn't weigh more than 90 pounds, and I gave her my apple, and I gave her my blanket, and then like five hours later, I wished I hadn't gave her that blanket because it was cold in there, and um, then we went our separate ways, and I didn't see her until the next morning when we came before the judge, and when we came before the judge, you know, and this girl was uh, was in there for a solicitation of... Um, solicitation of prostitution. She was basically doing what she needed to do to get what she needed to get. But I looked at her like, she's a drug addict. You know, she's so much worse than me. You know, and I mean, I just looked at her and I judged her. And, you know, and then I had this epiphany because she looked over and said to me, and I'll never forget this. She said, I don't know what you drank last night, but you stink. And there... Bam, drop the mic, you know. That was before that term is popular, but I'm telling you. I look, And then I looked. I looked around, and I realized that I had an orange jumpsuit on. She also had an orange jumpsuit on. And at that moment, all that just passed away, and I realized that I was an alcoholic and I needed to get some help. 
So I had to do something really hard, something I'd never done because I was always self-sufficient, but I had to call my mom to bail me out of jail. And I was 38 years old. And that was pretty embarrassing because the boyfriend wasn't going to bail me out, needless to say. And my mom made me promise. She said, you've got to promise me if I do this, I don't want you to pay me back. I want you to get help. So I got out of jail and I did whatever good alcoholic would do. I went back in that closet and drank the rest of that Gramignet that I'd left there two nights ago before I got locked up. And uh, then I called AA. Um, this was back when there were still phone books. It's easy to find AA. It was right at the front. <laughs> and I called, and I just called the first place on there because that place was B, Biscayne, the Atlanta Biscayne Room. So um, I called the Atlanta Biscayne Room, and I said, you know, I think I might have a problem. When is your next meeting? And um, this guy named Frank, and he's no longer with us, but he um, said he was really country. I mean, when I met him, he was exactly as I thought he would look. He had overalls on and a beard, and he said, Come on in. There's a meeting at 6 o'clock. And I was like, perfect. Because I worked at Lowe's in the garden center, and my break just happened to be 6 o'clock. And Claremont Road was, I worked at the one over there on Peachtree Industrial. Claremont Road's right around the corner. So there I go. And there's my experience, my first experience with AA. And I'll tell you what, I'm so grateful that I went there because they have what you call um, hardcore old timers there that were like, not in this, oh, I'm so sorry. They were just like, if you want to get better, hang out. We'll help you. If you don't, come back when you're ready, you know. And, and I'm so grateful for that because I was such, um, I was in such that victim mentality. It was everybody else's fault but mine. And I really needed people to be difficult to me, not difficult, hard on me. And they were. And um, I found a real good sponsor and, um, she was really, really good, and she really, really helped me, and she was real tough. She worked at Mar, and um, she was a tough one, and I needed that, and I was grateful. But at about 100 days in, I got really, like, irritable, restless, discontent, like it talks about in the book, and I needed some relief. I didn't want to drink, but I needed some relief, but I really did want to drink. But I was telling myself that lie that we tell ourselves, you know, if you've ever relapsed, you know the lie, you know. Well, I could smoke some pot, and it would be okay. I could take this pill and it would be okay, you know, or I could go out and act out in some other way and it would be okay. So what I did was I went to a doctor and I said, I can't eat. I can't sleep. I'm miserable. I've got racing thoughts. Gee, sounds like, you know, new sobriety. I see that now, but, uh, you know, and if I just would have hung in there, you know, if I just would have persevered, but, um, so I conned her and I'm, Alcohol is my drug of choice. I would usually say yes to just about anything else, but alcohol was always where I wanted to be. That was what I what I wanted. Um, but I conned her into giving me some um, a few Xanax. It was ten, and she said, "Take a few days off, get some rest. I'm not going to give you any more. I know you're an alcoholic, and I'm not going to give you any more." Well, of course. <laughs> I called my sponsor and I said, well, she's going to give me these. I mean, it's not alcohol. And she said, you can't, you can't do that. If you do that, you're going to drink. And I was like, no, you know, if you've ever worked with somebody, we usually know when a relapse is coming. If you're working close enough with your sponsor, we really can see it coming, you know, um, and she saw it coming. So of course, the minute that I got, I think I was at the CVS right over there in Brookhaven. I mean, the minute that I walked out, I think I took like three of them, you know. <laughs> so come Monday morning, I was supposed to go back to work. And Monday morning, I think I had one left maybe. And Monday, I went to work. And I mean, I think I was pretty fish-headed too. I mean, I think I was pretty much useless that day at work because I was over-medicated. Um, and uh, that day on my lunch break, when I left, instead of going down to the Biscayne room, I turned the other way and I went to the liquor store and I had my one and only relapse. And that was when, um, the deal was sealed for me. Um, lots of things happened that I really don't care to share in here, but, um, I woke up by the grace of God. Uh, I remember pulling the last, bought two big bottles of wine and I remember pulling the cork out of the last one and I woke up the next day and it looked like I had a party with about 50 people in my apartment, which I could have. I don't know. Things were turned over. Wine, there was wine just all over the carpet. Um, the strangest thing is that um, 
I had these uh, wrought iron side tables, and I guess I dropped a bottle of wine through one, so glass was everywhere. And in trying to pick the glass up while I was on the ground, somehow up underneath my bed, underneath the middle of my bed, was one single footprint in red wine. To this day, I don't know, did I shrink and become a person with one foot and run around with wine? I don't know what happened. Um, when they moved, when they tore those apartments down, they're called Peachtree Gardens. Amy used to live over there too. And when they tore those down, I really, I really wanted to go in there and get that little square of carpet, you know, and, and, and take it out as a remem- as a memory. But, um, I don't know what happened, but so, People were worried about me. I mean, people from my work were coming, and they're like, why aren't you coming to work? And I had to go into work and say, look, I'm an alcoholic. I had a relapse. And they were like, my God, we can't believe this. You're such a good worker. I mean, imagine how great you'd be if you were sober, you know? (laughs) So, uh, you know, so I got back on the horse, and that was when I was done. So... I really worked the steps really, really good. I I had a great sponsor. Um, At about 11 months in, I changed sponsors because she was having some personal problems, and I found another sponsor in the same group. And she taught me, she was Jewish, and she taught me more about God than anybody. Probably, I've learned a little bit more about him in the last few years, but she taught me about a loving God that loved me and cared about me and, and, and wanted good for me. And, um, you know, when, when we did that fourth, that third step prayer, she got on her knees with me and Jewish people generally don't pray on their knees. And and she prayed on her knees with me, you know, and that meant something to me. And she worked those steps with me and we worked all that out. And I made an amends to that man that I used to abuse and, uh, we're friends, you know, he forgave me. He always said, I knew you were a good person. He goes, I didn't even want you to go to jail that night. I just wanted you to quit beating up on me, you know? So, um, that second sponsor worked for a long time. And then, um, like everybody else, pretty much in AA and it just happens. And you know, when this and this and this gets all involved and you start doing things that people say, you really should wait. So I found the unhealthiest person that I could find in AA and decided that I wanted him. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, he was, uh, if you've ever been in the Biscayne room before, they actually have a bar in there. There's a bar in the back of the room. So the only thing different was that we were drinking coffee, you know. But, I mean, I spotted him. Never seen him before. My sponsor said, why don't you try coffee? Well, okay. And that didn't work. So, <laughs> you know, I um, I self-inflicted a lot of pain on myself during that. And um, my sponsor really had a hard time with it because people knew this person wasn't good, but I couldn't hear it, you know. Like I said, when this gets involved with the lower region, all, all, bound, all it's all off. And, and you, you know, that's one thing we tell people not to do in AA, but we're going to do it. It doesn't do any good, you know, I mean, and I'm just being real, you know, because six months in, you start looking good, you know, you like, people are like, you starting to look like you might be sober, and then somebody pays you a little attention, I'll never forget, the guy said, I want to peel you like a grape, and I'm like, oh, hey, hey, okay, all right, <laughs> you know, I mean, I didn't even know what that meant, but I was like, it sounds good, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, 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 you know, I, I I add levity because we got to laugh in here. We got to laugh at ourselves. We got to laugh at the crazy stuff that we do, man. We're human, you know? I mean, just because we get sober doesn't mean that we cut off emotions. It means that we feel them more, you know? And and I'm so grateful for those experiences, even those painful ones, because I learned a big lesson in that. And to get real serious about it, at about five years in, not only had I not been in a healthy relationship as of yet, including this one, but I didn't know how to get out of it. And in getting out of it, it caused me a tremendous amount of emotional pain because here I am. I can't go out and get drunk. I'm not going to go to the bar and, you know, do that. And I'm sitting with all this pain. So I went to Al-Anon. 
And I know this is AA, but my story is Al-Anon saved my life all over again. So if you want to learn about healthy ways to have healthy relationships, that's your ticket, you know. And uh, my Al-Anon sponsor says, you don't have to scratch the surface of an alcoholic too far to see an untreated Al-Anon. And she has 43 years in the Al-Anon program, so she's pretty skilled. Um, <laughs> and she helped me, and she, she really got me through that. And that was also when I found my sponsor that I have now. And uh, that was in uh, 2008. And um, she's awesome. And I share about sponsor because in order to persevere, you have to have someone to be honest with. You have to have, you don't have to come in here and be probably as honest as I'm being tonight, but you have to have someone that you can tell what is going on with you. Even if you're embarrassed, even if you're ashamed, even if you feel like, how can I tell somebody this? You know, I feel like such a loser. You got to have somebody. And, you know, the sponsor that I have now, the reason I have her is because my sponsor that was trying to help me through this bad relationship, we got so emotionally invested with each other. It was very painful for her. And, and we couldn't talk about that anymore. And so I had to do something else. So, and I also met my sponsor that I have now in the other other fellowship that starts with a C, and that one's a good one, too. They use the same book. So, um, you know, I mean, the way I feel about recovery is it's all good, man. I mean, if you're going somewhere and you're trying to get some help, do it. Whatever A is, whatever letter is in front of the A, just do it, you know. Um, so the sponsor that I have now has been extremely instrumental, and a few years ago she had to move away. Um, because of some family reasons, and that was really, that was hard on me, because she lived right here in Dunwoody, and we were really close, and I just loved her, and, you know, one of the last things she did when she was here was she adopted a baby. She's a single mom, and she adopted a baby, and that's only because she's sober, you know. They don't, they don't do that with people that are drinking and using. Her daughter is a product of people that drink or use, and, and it was a God thing totally, but um, I use her still, you know, she is my friend, she's my rock, and, um, you know, I, I don't know what I would do without her, you know, so sponsorship is so important, and when I met her, I said, you know, I know that I got some fourth step work to do, and what we did was we sat down and we went through the book together, we sat on her couch and we went through the book together, and I'm, I'm one of those... Um, uh, I guess they call them like big book thumpers. I'm not so much anymore, but I know the book well, and I love the book, and I believe the book. Do I believe every single word in it applies to me personally? Yes. Do I believe that people do it differently? Yes. But I, I believe in the book, and I believe in the program, and, it, and it's worked for me for almost 14 years now. So we sat down, and we went through the book, and we talked about it. We took our time. You know, I was in no hurry. It wasn't like I'm, you know, like I, oh, you know how when, I don't know about you guys, when I went through the steps the first time, man, I needed to go through the steps. I was an eager beaver. I mean, I wanted to get it out. I was ready to be sober. I was 38, so I was done. You know, the drinking was just crappy. It was horrible. It never did anything but ended up in bad for me, you know, and it just wasn't fun anymore, and I didn't want to die. I wanted to live, um, so uh, what I started doing, I want to tell you about some specific, yeah, I'm good. Um, I wanted to tell you something. Once I got really good and sober and I got through that bad relationship thing, and I also worked the steps through the al and al just the other side of the coin, you know, it's just, and it was really helpful. And um, once I got through that, um, and I had made the big amends, but the amends that I've really worked on probably for the last seven or eight years were the amends to my parents. I never really did anything bad to them, like, but what I did was I stole time from them. I wasn't there for them. You know, I didn't go to any of my grandparents' funerals. I wasn't capable of that. I'd say I was going to go, but I didn't go. I couldn't handle that, you know. I'd either get drunk the night before or just the thought of being having to actually be there for someone else was too much for me. So for the last year... Seven or eight years, I've really been working on the relationship with my parents. My dad lives in Alabama, and I make it a point every month or so to go see him. I'm going to go see him next weekend and spend Father's Day with him, and I try to do that as much as I can, play golf with him. I had my first sober round of golf with my dad when I was 42 years old. I made a birdie, you know. It wasn't the first game I ever played, but the first game I ever played with him, I made a birdie. I'll never forget it. A little par three. It was great. 
big, big day for me. Um, probably hadn't made too many more since then, but... <laughs> um, and I spend a lot of time with them. You know, I'm making those living amends. And um, for my mom, um, my mom uh, in 2008 was diagnosed with breast cancer. And uh, that was when I really decided that I wanted to make that amends with my mom um, and really, really work on it. So up until about January of this year, I talked to my mom every day on the phone, Monday through Friday. I walk dogs for a living. I own my own pet sitting business and I'd walk dogs, with, talk with my mom and she's retired and, you know, we'd just talk and sometimes it would be repetitive and sometimes, because she didn't get out a lot. She was, she had a bad back and she was getting older and she had survived the breast cancer, you know? And, um, so, uh, I really, really worked on talking with her and seeing with her and, you know, as you get older, your parents start to share little pieces of themselves with you that you don't know about. Cherish those pieces, man. I mean, really, really cherish them. Um, anyway, um, so I really, really worked on that. And in 2011 um, was when I met Steve. We love Flemings, and one of our first major first dates, we went into Flemings, and I said, "Oh, it just so happens, I know, I know a guy that works there," and he didn't know that I knew the guy that works there, you know. So um, that started working out real good, and I knew how to have a healthy relationship, you know. And um, we had a very long um, engagement, but January the twenty second of this year, right in front of the Georgia Dome before the Packers game, we got married. <laughs> It was just him and I and the person, our friend who officiated, and his wife. They're customers of mine, and it was perfect, and it was wonderful. And, you know, unfortunately, what happened a couple of weeks later wasn't so great, but they did beat the Packers, okay? Huge Falcons fan. Huge Falcons fan. So, um, anyway, um, so that was long in the making. Um, I had some fear about being married, um, you know, I wanted to make sure that when I did it, that I was ready. So uh, I'm going to back up a little bit, and I'm going to share with you what's been going on with me in the last year. And this is where the perseverance comes in, you guys. And I may cry, but I'm going to hold it together as best I can, so just bear with me. Um, last Memorial Day, uh, my husband and I, we watched a movie, and we were going to go out and uh, light our little fireplace out in the back and just have some quiet time. The people next to us had been having this big party. You know, they were whooping it up. Not that I judge them. They're friends. Hey, I'd be doing the same thing if I wasn't sober on Memorial Day. And their son was unattended with some fireworks, and he put some fireworks in the trash can, and uh, it burned both of our homes to the ground. And we lost everything. It was a total loss. We didn't lose everything because we got out alive. There were no deaths. And uh, our cat and our dog both survived, too. My cat was in the fire the whole time. And um, here's a guide shot. If, you don't, if it ain't God, I don't know what it is, but my cat was in that fire. We couldn't get her in the kennel because she was so agitated. And if you've ever been through something like that, it happens so fast. And you have such a small amount of time to do what you need to do. We're, we're kind of prepper, so we had a backpack, you know, with some things. And we got the car out of the, both the cars out, and I got the dog out. We were trying to get the cat out, and, and it just got too bad, too quick. Windows were shattering, and um, so we had to leave. And, um, you know, I just, leaving a living thing in a burning house, you know. And um, we sat across the street, and we watched our house burn to the ground. You want to talk about needing some perseverance and some insurance? Let me tell you, you're going to need it because things are going to happen. Things are going to happen. Life is going to happen. Life's going to shoot you some stuff that you are not going to expect. I did not expect that. But we made it. And I'll tell you how we made it. People in AA stepped up. One of my sponsees showed up for me the next day. I'm a pet sitter. I had like eight people out of town. I can't just let dogs sit in their house unattended because my house burned down. She came and drove me to every single customer. And then she took me to a meeting. That's why you need AA. That's why you need perseverance. So one month after that, my mom started 
um, I failed to tell you this, but my mom got diagnosed with lung cancer about a month before our house burned down. Um, and she decided she wanted to fight it. Um, I was in church uh, in a very strenuous program called Stephen Ministry, and I was becoming a Stephen minister during that time. So I was increasing my spirituality. I want to see how God's working, you know. That night when that when we got finished with that fire, my husband now, he wasn't my husband then, wanted to go into his office to see if he could get his Bible that his dad left for him. His dad had given him when he was a small child. Somehow his office was the room that was least damaged. Somehow that door had gotten shut. By the way, if you have a fire, the best thing you can do is shut the door if you're trapped somewhere. Just a little FYI. But we opened that door, and that room was smoke damaged, but it wasn't burned. We opened that door. Steve reached for his Bible, and we heard, Meow. My cat was in there alive up underneath the chair, the farthest away from the fire. So, hello, God. God took care of us even then, you know. <laughs> but people in AA, they rallied around us. They started a GoFundMe page that, that, that gave us $5,000 that we could... You don't realize... I'd like to have a glass of water. Well, you don't have a glass anymore. I'd like to feed my dog. Well, you don't have a dog bowl anymore. You know, so that money padded us until our until our renter's insurance came in, and uh, and then we um, got a small apartment. We're living very small and very humble. We used to live in Martin's Landing. Now we live in a small, tiny thousand bedroom, thousand square foot apartment, and we're okay. You know, we made it through it because I didn't. Quit going to AA. I wasn't able to do a whole lot. I really couldn't sponsor people. I didn't have a lot to give. I wasn't able to be uh, at a Steve. I want you know. I just graduated from this Stephen Ministry, and Stephen Ministry is basically uh, kind of walking with someone more from a Christian standpoint, but it's much like sponsorship. Um, uh, and, and I really wanted to get into that. I really wanted to do that because I had that calling. That was why I went through the six months of training to do it in the first place. And everything just kind of stopped. And then, um, and then um, my mom uh, had, uh, this is harder than it was the last time. My mom had six rounds of radio. Of, chemotherapy and eight rounds of radiation, 38 rounds of radiation, and it didn't work. And um, in January of this year, she said she didn't want to fight it anymore. And my mom passed away April the 1st of this year. And you want to talk about needing some insurance. But you know what? I wouldn't trade it. I was right there with her. You know, the person that brought me into this world. I walked her right up until the last moment that I could. I was right there. I was with her for the last three weeks. As a matter of fact, Jerry called me and asked me if I wanted to tell my story. First time I've ever said no, I said, I can't. I got to be with my mom right now. And he said, you do what you need to do. You want to talk about needing some AA insurance? You know, and, 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 and that's the hardest thing I've ever had to do. It, it, you just can't, but I didn't want to drink. I didn't want to go and do anything stupid. I wanted to be respectful. I wanted to be there for my mom, and I was, and I would have missed that. I would have missed that if I was drunk. And as hard as it was, it was one of the most beautiful gifts. I, I hate it that people have to go through it. It is one of those things in life that as we get older, it's going to happen. It's the natural process, but it's a crap storm, let me tell you. Um, but I'm so grateful that I got to be with her. And I want to tell you that when I was sitting with her before she wasn't really with us anymore, I went to go say I'm sorry to her. And she stopped me. And she said, we've done that. You know, I didn't have to sit at my mom's bedside for the last three weeks and apologize for all the crap. That I had done for all the times I wasn't there for her. And I have to do that. It was done. You know why? Because I stayed in AA. That's why. So um, I miss my mom. Miss her a lot. It's only been two months now, you know. But um, tomorrow, um, 
I'm going to go do a, uh, they're doing a, the hospice place that was with her is doing a butterfly release for all the people that passed, you know. My mom didn't want a funeral. She didn't want a memorial. She donated her body to Cancer Research at Emory. She was a very humble woman. She was awesome. You know, it's funny as you get older, like when you're young and people say, you're just like your mom and you're like, oh God. And then when you get older, you're like, you're just like your mom. And you're like, hell yeah, I am. You know, (laughs) I mean, it's like, wow. And it's only because of AA, you know, it's only because of the program that I can say these things. And even though it's the hardest thing I've ever had to do, it was also a gift, you know, like I was able to do something for her. I was able to be there. My mom lives with her sister. I was able to, to, to be there and be present and be helpful the last few weeks of my mom's life, you know. And I'll tell you, I wouldn't change that for anything in the world. And um, after that happened, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to be real honest with you because I have been up to this point. Um, I didn't want to go to AA. I was afraid. <laughs> And it's so funny because I think I'm so important and everybody's going to rush up to me and be like, oh, my God, we heard about your mom. Well, you know, the people that knew about my mom already knew, you know, my home group knew. Nobody was going to, like, bug me or bombard me. That was all in my little ego head, you know. I mean, I went to a meeting and I was like, boy, I wish I would have done that last week because I just stayed away for about three weeks. I needed to process it, you know. I w- it wasn't like I'm never going back to AA again, but it was like... I just wasn't ready, you know, it's just that simple. And, and, you know, there are times when I think everybody walks away for a little bit or steps away, I guess I'd like to say. But that's the most, I've been sober almost 14 years, and three weeks was the longest I've ever been without a meeting, I'm going to tell you. And by the time I was ready to go to that meeting, I was ready to go to that meeting. And it was my home group. By the way, my home group is the happiness group at 1, o'clo- one o'clock at the 8111 Club. And, um... Those people, you know, they love me, you know. They know what I'm going through, and um, they don't judge me or shame me. And, you know, my biggest, the hardest thing that I've had to learn, I guess, in sobriety is, like, it's okay not to be the strong, tough girl all the time, you know. I want people to think I got it going on all the time, you know. Look at me. I'm Sandy. Don't you know who I am? You know, and 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 that took me a long it took me a long time to realize that I don't have to be the strong person all the time. I can just be Sandy. You know. So um, the last year has been quite interesting. My husband has had some issues with jobs, and he's had to take a job that doesn't pay a lot compared to what he's been making, and we're still okay. You know. Um, the good thing that's happening is that I find I didn't get to go on a honeymoon because right after, you know, we got married, my mom, it was the last about month and a half of her life. So I'm going on a honeymoon, um, and uh, we uh, we are hikers and campers, and, you know, we love outdoors, and, and, and we're a little bit of, we do some prepping, and, you know, I found a... I found a great dehydrator for five bucks at a yard sale the other day, man. And I mean, I'm like turkey jerky queen right now, you know, (laughs) I'm like, woo, mad skill. So, you know, I'm like, there's, and my point in saying all this is like, I'm getting ready to go on a honeymoon. I'm happy, joyous, and free. Life is going to happen. Things are going to happen. But man, the world is like still so awesome. And there's so many things left to do that are wonderful and awesome. And I don't know if I'm ever going to catch up on everything I want to do because I had drunk for a long time. I mean, when you're a bartender, you pretty much drunk all the time. I mean, I don't think in 25 years I drew very many sober breaths. But I I know that um, there's things I want to do. I hope that I get to do a lot of the things. We're going out west. We're going to Nevada. I've never been to Nevada before. I've never been out west. So I hear that um, it's dry heat, you know. So so I'm like, exactly what the hell is dry heat? And they're like, okay, well, you turn your, you know, it's, I I look, I put it in my phone, you know, Laughlin, Nevada. It's like, oh, it's 112 there, but it's dry heat. And I'm like, what does dry heat mean? Well, that just like, oh. Turn your turn your oven on 110 and put a fan in front of it and sit in front of it. And that's what it feels like. And I'm like, why the hell would I do that, for one? But, you know, I, I'm getting to do something different. We're going to do some hiking. We're going to do some kayaking. The, the, the hotel we're staying is right on the Colorado River. We're going to do some jet skiing, you know. I mean, there's so much beauty left in the world. And, I mean, I'm sorry I got real serious and, and, and kind of, 
Eh. But, you know, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm being so forthright is because none of this would have been possible without the program. I couldn't, I can't imagine going through the last year without having that anchor, that network, those people in my life. God, the program, my sponsor, my friends, my sponsees, for gosh sakes, you know. I mean, they've done more for me than I feel like I've done for them in the last year, you know. And and none of that would have happened had I not had that bottom, you know. Thank God for bottoms. Thank God that God gave me the gift of desperation. Thank you, God, you know, for all that you've done for me, for all the crappy things that that I did, and for all the crappy things you took away from me, for all the crappy things I thought I wanted that I didn't get. Thank you, God, for that, you know? I mean, man, if I would have gotten everything that I wanted, Lord of mercy, it would not have been pretty. So, um, you know, the reason that I spoke of perseverance and and hope is I hope that something that I've said will make you want to come back to AA tomorrow and next week and next month and next year. I love it when I go to a meeting and I see people, I go to meetings in Bonita Springs. We have a house down there. And not only am I the youngest person age-wise, but I'm the youngest person sobriety-wise. There's people down there with like 50 years sitting in a meeting but they're retired, you know. Man, I mean, it's cool in there because it's like, you know, they turn it up to hell down there in Bonita Springs. It's right next to the Keys. So, but, um, you know, I love it when I go to meetings and I see people with a lot of time. You know, it reminds me that I'm going to probably be having to do that when I'm in my 60s and 70s. I'm going to go to AA, you know. And the perseverance is, even when you don't want to do it, just do it. You never know what gift you might be gifted the day that you walk in and you don't feel like going to a meeting and you don't want to be there and you wish you were like right now I'm like this meeting's too late I want to be home watching Netflix they rolled out Orange is the New Black tonight you know what I'm saying I need to go home and binge you know I mean I'm being honest but I mean I'm like this is where I need to be this is where I said I was going to be this is where I was going to be and here I am you know sometimes you don't always want to do what you need to do but you do it anyway. So um, I think that's all that I, I want to say. I hope that something that I've said has helped you guys. And, you know, thank you for Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you, God, my higher power for everything. And uh, I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.